Good evening. Good to see everyone once again. As we come to the close of another Lord's Day, I do want to let each and every one of you all know that I have truly enjoyed my stay here with you all. You all have really extended the hand of love and hospitality towards me to the point that I really don't want to leave. But I know that I have to go. But needless to say, I am appreciative of the things that you all have done today. The Harpers, I had a chance to spend some time with them after the AM service. And I was joking with Gary, asking him, how does he stay so small? The food was so good, I don't know how he's so small. I really enjoyed the time with them, the fellowship, the food, um, their uh, lovely son, his lovely wife, their children, just had a great time and wanted to extend that to them as well. Everyone turn over to Romans chapter eight. Romans chapter eight. We're gonna look at a few things this evening with the intent in mind that we as Christians may be strengthened on this journey. Because you all do know that we're on a journey. We're not here to stay. This earth is not our home. As a matter of fact, we have a song that we sing. We sung it this morning. This world is not my home. I'm just passing through. So we need to keep that in mind because many times it is easy for us to fall back into the ways of the world and to assume that this is our home. When we do that, we lose sight of what our real home is. So in Romans chapter 8, I'm going to read verse 31 through 39, and then we'll come back and execute a few of these scriptures or explain it. Verse 31, Paul, writing to the Christians in the church of Christ in Rome, says, What shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God, who also maketh intercession for us. Notice that pronoun, us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress, persecution, famine, nakedness, peril, or sword? As it is written, for thy sake, we are killed all the day long. We are accounted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. For I am persuaded. What are you persuaded, Paul? That neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. If I were used for a subject this evening, it's very simple. God plus nothing equals everything. God plus nothing equals everything. You know, when we look at our world today, many people have a lot of things, but they don't have God. So that means that regardless of what they do have, they really, when you think about it, don't have anything. But as Christians, we need to be reminded that if we've obeyed the gospel and we're striving to remain faithful until our dying day, with God, if we have nothing else, we hold everything. And sometimes we don't carry ourselves that way. That's the reason for this lesson, so that we can be reminded of what we have. Therefore, we can continue this journey with the joy that we talked about this morning. To the Christian, remember, our joy is never and should never be based upon our circumstances. Our circumstances do not determine our joy. Our joy should be based upon God. 
And therefore, regardless of what we go through in this life, we will be able to maintain. We will stay the course. We won't sway left or right. We won't be easily tricked or persuaded. So as we look at this, these te this text here, there's a couple things I want us to understand. First of all, Paul is writing to Christians that have obeyed the gospel. Turn to Romans chapter 1. We're going to prove that. Look at Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1. Look at verse 5. Paul says, By whom we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations, for his name. Verse 6. Among whom are ye also the called? The called of Jesus Christ. To all that be in Rome, beloved of God, look at it, here, here it is again, called to be saints. Grace to you and peace from our God, from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We are all called the same way. And we're called by the gospel. Thus these individuals who Paul was writing to are individuals that were called by the gospel. It was because of the gospel that they were saved. Paul said, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it, it would, the gospel, is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first, and also to the Greek. That's Romans 1.16. Then verse 17, Paul says, for therein, therein where? The gospel is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. For it is written, the just shall live by faith. Well, how does the just live by faith? Romans 10, 17. So then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So we must abide in God's word. Now, Paul is writing to Christians, those that have obeyed the gospel. And then look what he tells them. Look at, look at Romans 8. And we're going to look at a couple of things here. In Romans 8. Before we get to verse 31, Paul has spoken of a couple of things that I want us to understand in which what he was talking about. Now, Romans 8, verse number four, the Bible says that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. So there's a, there, there is a comparison or a, a transition here. Paul is talking about the flesh versus the spirit. Walking after the flesh or walking after the spirit. Now look at verse number five. For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the spirit, the things of the spirit. Now watch verse six. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. So Paul, after speaking to them about, and this really ties into us as well, about examining ourselves. We need to constantly, as Christians, examine ourselves. Friends, it's easy to look to your left and to your right, look behind you. But it's very hard to hold the mirror right here. We need to look at ourselves, examine ourselves, and prove whether we're walking according to the flesh or according to the spirit. Because that's what Paul is talking about here. He wants the Christian, and these are Christians in the church. He's writing to the church. And he's reminding the church. Examine yourself. Are you walking according to the flesh or the spirit? And he tells them the difference. And this is for us as well. Now, after he has explained those things, then we get over to verse 31, and he says, What shall we then say to these things? What things? The flesh versus the spirit. That's what he was talking about. What shall we say in reference to these things? He says, if God be for us, who can be against us? Who can be against us? You know, I think sometimes we, we don't think about what we really have. We don't think about what we really have. I was talking also with the Harpers today about it's something about the human race 
to where you could be somewhere and be there so long that you don't value what you have where you are. And someone can come where you are and point out all the things that they value, that you used to value, but you no longer value. For example, here at the Lexington Church of Christ, the singing's wonderful. The fellowship has been great. The number of men that you all have that serve on the table and to serve in the work of the Lord's church is phenomenal. And it needs to be appreciated. The preacher that you have, wonderful man, he needs to be appreciated. We're all here to work. We're not here to expect others to work. We all have a job to do. We're on the same team. But you know, sometimes we don't appreciate where we are. We don't appreciate what we have. Until you go somewhere and you see a congregation that's praying for what you already have. They can't find two men that want to serve. They can't find anyone that wants to do anything. And yet, we have it and don't value it sometimes. And that's on a human level. Imagine how we treat God. Who woke us up this morning? God. Who gave us our energy? God. It was because of God that we have everything that we have. And God expects us to put him first. But many times we put everything first except him. Many times we treat God as if he's a genie. He's in a bottle. When, when times get hard, we run to the bottle. God, come help me. When we get out of the situation, we put them back in the bottle until the next appointed situation. Friends, we need to examine ourselves. We need to examine ourselves. Worship is not a ritual. Worship is not a game that we do just on Sundays. This is serious. John 4, 24, for God is a spirit and they that worship him must, must worship him in spirit and in truth. It's possible, friends, to have all the mechanisms down pat. We sing, we pray, we give. Lord's Supper, preaching. You see, we can have all those things down pat, but if we don't have the right mindset, friends, it's in vain. It's in vain. That's why Jesus said that. They that worship him must. Worship him in spirit and in truth. Friends, to those that are faithful, I pray that you read Romans 8. Read the chapter. This will give you comfort. Paul is saying, if God is for us, Paul is including himself with the Christians that he's writing to. If God be for us, who can be against us. He despaired, that's God, despaired not his own son, but delivered him up for us, for us all. How shall he not with him also freely give us all things? This is more comfort. This is more comfort for the Christian. We all go through trying times. We all go through varying circumstances, but Paul is trying to comfort us about the bigger picture. On a spiritual level, the carnal level only looks at what we're going through. But Paul says, that's not the focus. The focus needs to be the bigger picture, the spiritual picture here. Who shall lay anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifieth. And Paul says something here in verse 34 that I want us to understand. He says... Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather that is risen again. Who is even at the right hand of God? There's more comfort. There's more comfort. Christ is not on this earth, people. Christ is on the right hand of God. That's comfort to us as Christians. Why? Because if you continue that verse, it says, Who also maketh intercession for us. Us who? Christians. Christ is making intercession for Christians. So that means as I'm being faithful, 
If I feel as if my load is becoming too heavy, I can pray to Christ. But if I'm not walking faithful, my prayers will not go beyond the ceiling. Why? Isaiah 59, 1 and 2. Your sins have separated between you and your God that he will not hear. It's not that God can't or won't hear. He's not going to. If we fall away from the truth and fall back into our own selfish desires, Christians, God, plus nothing else, equals everything for us. Everything. It's not wrong. It's nothing wrong with having things and, and, and possessing material things and things like that. But friends, God is the number one source. We need to keep that in mind. In Hebrews 10, turn over to Hebrews 10. In Hebrews 10, we're going to look at something here. In Hebrews 10 and verse 12, the Bible says something. Hebrews 10 and verse 12, the Bible says, But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God. We serve a risen Savior. Jesus Christ is alive. And he has all power in heaven and in earth. Matthew 28, 18. We need to remember that, Christians. Why? Because many times we fall away so easily. And I think it's because we don't understand what we have. We fall away so easy. The slightest little offense, we leave Christ. The slightest offense. But look at what Paul says. Turn back to Romans 8. I want to notice some things that Paul said here. Because for most people today, the slightest little thing that we don't like or we think should go one way or I don't like that color, I don't like the way that looks, whatever the case is, we allow those little petty things to cause us to leave the ark of safety. Friends, this is the ark of safety right here. The assembly, being in Christ, is our ark of safety. Why do we leave so easily? Why do we stray so easily? We do not understand what we have. Look at this, look at verse 35, Romans 8, 35. Paul says, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Now look at these things that Paul said. First, he mentioned tribulation. Now, tribulation carries the idea of a trying experience. Many people in here today have had trying experiences. But Paul says that shouldn't separate you from Christ. But sometimes we allow those situations to separate us. Paul says it shouldn't. And not only tribulation, Paul says, or distress. Distress carries the idea of a painful situation. Many of us have been through painful situations. The loss of a loved one, which I shared with you all this morning about my dad, still hurts me tremendously to this day. Very painful. But it's not going to separate me from Christ. Why? You see, what shall separate us? Not tribulation, not distress. Next, he mentions persecution. This carries the idea of a condition of being Persecuted, harassed. Why are you all worshiping without instruments? Why do you all not have a choir? That's, that's pers Friends, that's harassment. People asking you in a, in, a, in a picking type way of why you worship the way you worship. Why do you believe in God, a God that you can't see? Why do you all go back to worship at 6 o'clock? Why don't you all have this and why don't you all have that? You see are we that timid that we allow even those questions to separate us from the faith? God forbid. God forbid. Next, he mentions famine. What do you mean famine? A great shortage. In most cases, it refers to food. You know, if we look at our society today, friends, do you not know that if God, if God was to hold back the rain, think about this for a second, about sometimes we don't think about things. 
If God was to hold rain from us, what would happen to our food? What would happen to the farmers? What would happen to the animals? What would happen to us? What if God snapped his finger, figuratively speaking, and snatched all of the air out of society? He has the power to do that, you know. What would happen to everything on this planet? Friends, we'll be gone. How often do we think about that? You see what we take for granted? Even God's air. Friends, this is God's air that we're breathing. We're breathing it. We're alive. We're mobile. We have energy in our bodies. And God expects us to take what he has given us and give glory to him. Not ourselves. To him. There could be a famine coming in this land. We don't know what tomorrow brings, friends. But if a famine does come, will that separate you? Will that separate you from Christ? Or will it draw you closer to him? Let's continue here. At the famine, he says, nakedness, a lacking. In most cases, refers to clothing. You know, the price of things are going up, people. And we can't do anything about it. Gas, going up. Cost of living, going up. Food, going up. Pay, going down. You see? It could be the case, friends, that God is trying to get our attention. Maybe we've been placing too much attention on moving up the ladder according to the world. And God says... That's never been the case. You're safe in me only. Think about that, people. We're being pushed. Everything's coming in from all fours. And many of us refuse to notice the signs. We refuse to look. We refuse to look. But everything that happens, friends, is something we're supposed to learn from what's going on in our society. In our world, we're supposed to recognize, to wake up. We were speaking earlier about some uh, places in our society, in our country, that may have a disastrous storm go through, kill several. Sad occasion. People cry, many pray. But you would think something that devastating will cause those that are not in the faith, those that are not faithful, to wake up. It doesn't. Because after the storm is gone, and after the debris is cleaned up, and after things are being put back together, people go back to their same ways. Why? Why? We don't recognize what we have. We don't recognize what we have. The next thing that he mentions is peril. Peril gives the idea of exposure to the risk of being in danger. You know, if you're in a house and someone sets your house on fire, that's a peril experience for you. You're in the risk of danger. You know, the first century Christians were always in the midst of danger, friends. You know, sometimes I feel that maybe we would carry the gospel more seriously if persecutions came on us. You look at the first century Christians, friends, they were being killed. It's easy to read about that. But take your mind back to, the, to those events. They were being killed, slaughtered, not because they did anything wrong, friends, but because they would not denounce their faith. And they were being killed. Yet you would think that because of the persecutions, they would stop. Friends, they kept on preaching the gospel. That gave them more fuel. They kept going. The Bible says as they were scattered abroad, they went everywhere preaching the gospel. Even though they were being killed, stoned, burned alive. But you know what's so sad about that? Many of us haven't experienced anything near that. Many of us haven't had the slightest argument face to face. 
And yet, we go home, we close our books, we tell nobody about the gospel. What's the difference? Are we convicted? Do we believe what we teach? Do we really believe what we say we're convicted of? If so, friends, it is shown by our actions. Jesus said you should know a tree by the fruit that it bears. And we're all trees. An individual should be able to look at us and see the fruit. What type of fruit? The fruit of the spirit, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, faithfulness, gentleness. They should be able to see that in the lives, here it is, of every Christian. Not just one or two, every Christian needs to strive for those things. Why should we, preacher? Because we have God. And as long as we have God, friends, if everything else that we have was to vanish away today, we still have everything. Because God is over all. He's over all. But here's the thing, as I close. Here's the thing. We recognize that God is over all. We also recognize that we should not allow anything to separate us from the faith, from Christ, from God, from the perfect way. Because it is only by that perfect way that we will enter that perfect place. But we must remain in the way. We must remain in the way. Look at John 14. Turn over to John 14. I want you all to see something here. In John 14. Verse number six. Jesus said unto him, talking to Thomas, I am the way. The truth and the life, no man. Is that in your Bibles? No man. No man cometh to the Father but by Christ. But you know what? Many people in our world, they think they can go to the Father by other people. The Bible is clear. Jesus did not say, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh to the Father but by Muhammad. He didn't say that, friends. Jesus is the only way. He's the only way. And we must remain in the way. What does it mean to be in the way? To be in the way is to be in the bride of Christ, in the church, in the body of Christ. To abide by the teachings of of Christ, which he left for his apostles, which we have today. That's how we abide in the way, friends. We abide in the way by abiding in the truth. We must abide in the truth. Look at Ephesians 1. Ephesians 1, 22 and 23. Familiar passage. The Bible says, and has put all things under his feet, that's Christ, and gave him, Christ, to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body. The fullness of him that filleth all in all. The church is the body of Christ, and the body of Christ is the church. Well, how many bodies do we have? Ephesians 4.4. 4. There is one body. There's one body. There's one body. Christians, if we've obeyed the gospel, we're in that one body. We're in that one body, but we must remain faithful while in that one body or else we too will be a castaway. We too will be a castaway, castaway. Friends, it's one thing for us to obey the gospel, to hear God's word, to believe it with all sincerity, to repent of our sins, to confess Christ, to be baptized and shed all the tears that we would like to shed up front. But when we come out of that water, friends, this is not a time that our work ends. It's when our work begins. And for many of us as Christians, we come out of the water and we sit down. Friends, heaven is a prepared place for prepared people. We must get busy as Christians. And what will help us, what will help motivate us and comfort us to do those things that Christ asks of us is the fact that God is for us. 
Paul said, if God be for us, who, who can be against us? Who can be against us? I hope and pray that I've said some things this evening that will cause us to examine ourselves, to see whether we are in the faith or not, to see whether we're doing those things that Christ will have us to do. For there are times that we fall short. But friends, if you are a Christian and you've fallen short, there is a remedy. You can repent, confess that sin, and be right with God before you leave. If you have not obeyed the gospel, maybe you're visiting with us. I want you to understand that there's something that Paul said in Romans 8 that I want you to, that I want you to notice. Paul said something in Romans 8 that I want you to take heed to if you have not obeyed the gospel. In Romans 8, in verse number one, Paul says, there is therefore now no condemnation, watch this, to them which are in Christ. Wait a minute, what are you saying, Paul? Paul says, listen, to those that are in Christ, there's no condemnation. Which means that if you're not in Christ, you're in danger. You're in danger. Jesus said, if you die in your sins, where I am, you cannot come. But Lord, I'm a good person. Who told you you were good? You see what we do to ourselves? We elevate ourselves based on the little things that we do on this planet. But friends, we're only good if God says we're good. And what God calls good is those that obey him. And many people will say, oh, I'm a good person. I'm a good natural, you know, natured person. I love people. I love helping. I love doing this. I love doing that. Now, I know I haven't obeyed the gospel, but I'm a good person. Well, you know what? If you're a good person and you haven't obeyed the gospel, you're still in your sins. And your sins have separated you from God. Which means he's not listening, friends. We must do what God commands us to do. Hear the gospel. The gospel includes the death, burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. That's not the entirety of the gospel. The entirety of the gospel is the full, Old Test the, the full New Testament, is the entirety of the gospel. But the foundation of the gospel is the fact that Jesus Christ died, he was buried, and he rose again the third day. If Christ had not done that, we wouldn't be here. There would be no New Testament if he had not risen from the grave. But the fact that he did, that's our foundation. How do we know that? Because if Christ rose, we too will rise again to be with him. We must believe that. We must believe that. Without faith, it's impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them, catch this, friends, that diligently seek him. Friends, we have to really be seeking the right path if we have not obeyed. We must repent. Repentance is a change of mind that leads to a change of action. In Acts 17, 30, the Bible says at the time that this was ignorance, God winked at. There was a time where God winked at sin. But the Bible says, but now he commands all men everywhere to repent. We all must change our mind about sin and stop. Not slow down, friends. We need to stop. Once we repent, we must confess Christ to be the son of God, the same confession that the Ethiopian eunuch made as well. I believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And upon that confession, you must be baptized. What I was told, I didn't have to be baptized. If you read Mark 16, 15 and 16, Jesus Christ himself said, Go ye to all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. You must be baptized because in the water of grave of baptism, that is where your sins are washed away. It doesn't matter what you've done. God will remember them no more. Baptism not only saves you, but it places you into the area where the saved are located. And that's the church, Acts 2.47. Then you start a new life. You're no longer walking according to the flesh and the desires of your flesh. You're walking according to God's word. And if you remain faithful unto death, you can say what Paul said. There is laid up for me a crown of righteousness. Heaven will be your home. If you need to respond, please do so as we together stand and sing.